All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Nagura, and I'm here at Gamescom with the uh, main producer, George Valef, and production director, Michael Bybee. There we go. Thank you so much for joining me and answering some of my questions, hopefully. We will see. Happy to be here. <laughs> Happy to be here and to maybe answer your questions. Yeah. We'll see. All right. So my first question, if you can go, if you can start straight away. Uh, my question is about normal and heroic week. Because uh, for a while in Dragonflight, we had released normal multi heroic raids at the same time with Mythic. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we're going back to having the normal and heroic week before Mythic releases a week after. And when that was the case the last time, uh, you made sure or you told us that you wouldn't be doing any major balancing changes without announcing it beforehand. Mm -hmm. Is that something you plan on doing again? Or is your approach going to be different this summer? Generally, when we do things like normal road week into the Mythic week, we do use that information to sort of guide decisions for, you know, classes or specs that are maybe underpowered or overpowered. That being said, when we do these changes, we're very conscious of the fact that some players level, you know, 5, 10, 15 characters. We don't want to try to, you know, massively upset the meta. So when we do, you know, approach these conversations for tuning, our goal really is to do very slight adjustments for things that are overperforming and not really do too much more than that because players have spent time making their characters, gearing their characters up as well. We don't want to sort of, you know, take the timeline. So in terms of tuning updates and sort of timeline, you know, it is planned to do updates before Mythic Week and before Heroic Week, but depending on the data that we get. That being said, they're not going to be, you know, large changes to sort of change up people's expectations because fundamentally people have been preparing for, you know, the race world first and their own, you know, journey for quite a while. We don't want to sort of like take that away from them. Okay. So there will be like percentage damage changes, usually not like major changes to rotation or something like that, unless it's really required, I assume? Yeah, it'll be similar to what we did in Dragonflight, where, you know, before Mythics have unlocks and before Heroic unlocks, we'll be taking a look at classes and specs of how performing it or overperforming and making adjustments for sure. Okay. All right. Sounds interesting. Another question that um, that's, has been something on my mind for a long time, and I'm not sure if you can say anything to it, but basically my understanding of the way Mythic works currently, the Mythic rating, the difficulty, uh, to me it seems like that the skill gap between the world first guilds and like an average Mythic guild has grown so, so large that I feel like they're playing different games almost, right? Mm. And I can see how that causes lots of issues when it comes to tuning and the bosses and the difficulty itself. Uh, do you think that is a problem? Do you think, like, are you, is that something you think about? Is it something that you think is okay or that this is something that you want to tackle or what is your stance on that? Interesting question. It's a good question. Yeah, there is there is a very wide range of players. You know, there's the race world fo first folks, and there's folks who are pushing Hall of Fame, and there's folks who are just doing mythic normally, and that's just mythic flow. So there is a very wide range of skill expressions among players. And it is something we consider. It's, you know, why after certain bosses have been defeated at the race form first, we do sort of gradual or, you know, sometimes heavy nerfs. That's sort of the plan. It's something to keep in mind. This time around, our approach is to, you know, use the Severed Strands buff, which is sort of the, I think that's what it is. It's the gradual sort of buffing of player damage and healing over the course of the raid. So like months into the raid, your damaging needs to go up a little bit. And that gives us basically more agency where players feel like they're getting stronger and we don't have to sort of like keep nerfing bosses for the players um, to make sure they're making progress. So yeah, it's something to be taken into account. It's a very large skill gap, um, and that is something that we certainly keep in mind. Okay, interesting. I think the separate strands buff is also like it helps with player progression, considering the new system that we have with the upgrades, right? Because it feels like a lot of the upgrades that we get are really early on, and then at some point your player power progression kind of stops. So having the separate strands buff and continuing downwards, I think these the guilds that hope that maybe next time they can do it if they're really close to cleaning the loss. So I think that's kind of important as well. That's yeah, cool. So yeah. I like that a lot. So um, recently you've announced or you applied changes to Mythic Plus mm. Disorients. Yeah. So basically they're not going to be as strong anymore as they were in Dragonflight, where you just use uh, loads and loads of AOE disrupts and stuns to stop the cast from happening. Sure. And now the lockdown that has happened that happens on these casts is going to be a lot shorter. Yeah. Uh, which means that interrupts are going to be more important in return, right? Now there are some classes that either don't have interrupts at all, like priests, and there's a matter of being on pullback as way well. Is that something we think might be a problem in the class that you maybe address if it is? Or do you think that's just something that is like left to work? Well, I'll talk about the Mythic Plus 
change of some of this. And if you want to dive sure. into the glass side, I think that would be a great way to cover this. But first and foremost, we always look at the tools that players have when we're designing the encounters in Dunblings and the big coast specifically. And the changes you're talking about where it stops no longer completely interrupt the cast and then it just goes off again. Really, it's it's not just about emphasizing kicks, it's about emphasizing deliberate play and strategy in the way that you pull the dungeon and the way that you choose to engage in certain packs of mobs. So it's about giving players you know, choices or basically making them have to make more interesting choices or have to grapple with that in the same way. And obviously that that's a little bit of a balance when some classes have some of the and their classes have you know, don't have the same, they have one, two, them, et cetera. But the overall intention for all of the mythic plus changes that we made this time is to encourage a more deliberate play style. Um, it, it basically slow down the, like, we're going to Zerg every single pack, AE it all up, burn it down, and then move on to the next thing. And, and actually, you know, some of those abilities, you should have to choose. No, I want to grapple with this versus this, and I'm not going to pull that back because I know we don't have a stop for that. I'm going to pick for that quite yet. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to kind of follow up question yeah, about it, if that's totally. okay. Um, so you're saying that, and this is something that I've seen in the changes as well, that uh, it looks like you're trying to stop players from doing bigger pulls and just serving everything down, as you say, just aiming stopping it. Um, I guess. To me, it feels like that is what I like doing them. Like, yeah. I like doing these big pulls and pressing my big AOE button, seeing like big numbers, right? I think a lot of players really do enjoy that. And whenever I think there's changes that are being applied to the game that stop me from doing that, especially in a, in a forceful way, because if it's just more difficult to do it, then I know, okay, we just have to play better to execute that. Yeah. But if there's something that really completely stops you from doing that, like so certain auras that have you need damage reduction, stuff like that, um, then I feel like, okay, no matter what I do, I can't do this big pool. Sure. And is this something that uh, you're aware that people like these big pools and they're still trying to stop totally, them? Totally, or... totally. And like, I, I, I enjoy that as well. A lot of people do, but if you follow the through line, if you if if the progression of gameplay is bigger and bigger pulls, and uh, all you're doing is, hey, I, I'm basically trying to pull as much of the dungeon as I possibly can, and then burn it down and move on to the next one, and do that and do that, it forces a specific group on. It forces the all of the interesting mechanics that might actually make the dungeon one dungeon different from another dungeon starts to like get sort of rubbed down, so that it everything starts to feel the same running different mythic plus dungeons uh, becomes very, very repetitive. And then ultimately in the long run, uh, it, it means that some players don't have the option to participate if they don't want to play one of the, the classes that are specifically required to do that. So like thinking about Demon Hunter Tank in the last season, said where like in order to do what you were talking about, you had to absolutely um, have a Demon Hunter Tank player group. You had to have certain classes and those kinds of things. And so this is like, it's the challenge with game design is always like, okay, can we, not turn it back all the way so that we're absolutely forcing you to play like that but can we dial the knob back a little bit and then see how it goes get feedback see if it's like oh no nobody likes this we've gone too far okay let's let's turn the knob back a little bit more and then see um, and i think really high skill players are still going to be doing a lot of this and it'll be make maybe slightly smaller goals than what they've been in the past or with some of the tank debuffs that have happened like you might have to be a little bit more careful and then we'll see how progression goes throughout the entire expansion we have one more follow-up question. Sure. Uh, priests. Oh, priests getting interrupted. I mean, as uh, Michael mentioned, really our goal is to try to give players the tools that they have to basically succeed in different environments. Priests getting interrupts, uh, you know, I can't speak to whether that is or isn't happening. Um, over the course of Dragonflight, we saw a lot of class changes. A lot of things are on sort of the menu. Um, hero talents are another part of the game that we're going to be looking, you know, very closely at. Uh, we've added a lot of crop patrol hero talents. Um, we're going to be making it then making sure that they're going in the right direction, that they're tuned properly. Um, so I think players can expect a lot of class updates and spec updates. And honestly, even hero talent updates going into more within what specifics for things like priest getting interrupts. Can't really talk. Okay. And other classes getting shorter interrupts? I mean. <laughs> the solar beam is still one minute, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, but it's it's an AOE silence, right? So there's there. That's true. That, that's true. Uh, no, no current plans on changing solar beam for now, at least not for launch. Okay. <laughs> I had to try. All right. Then I was wondering about when it comes to class balancing. Um, we've seen a lot of class balancing, or usually we see a lot of class balancing at the start of patches and we start of expansions. Mm -hmm. That are more focused on you know, grids, right? On single target damage profiles, 
and to make sure that everyone's kind of in line, everyone is valuable. Um, but when it comes to a class, I think balancing a class in particular when it comes to damage profiles is something that um, like has to be for the whole season, right? And if changes already happen at the start of a season and not too many changes happen later, it feels like, oh, the meta has evolved like two months in and now this is like something that everyone plays and all the other classes are kind of being left wherever they are and they're not being buffed or nerfed as much. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you want to maybe do differently in the world we're in and do more and pass focus changes later on? It's an interesting sort of you know, problem that you're bringing up, right? Because it's sort of the same boat of people have picked their spec for whatever content they're doing, in which case Mythic Plus. So if we go through and we massively change, you know, how one class of spec performs, you would like, they sort of like, well, I was going to play this, but now, you know, now we nerfed it, so I can't even play that anymore. So to a certain extent, we do want to basically try not to upset meta too much. That being said, uh, considering Mythic Plus is such a vast part of the game, for some people, it's the only thing that they do, which is great. Um, same for content like PvP. When we talk about tuning, we do talk about Mythic Plus, we do talk about PvP, and we have separate conversations entirely for like things like Battleground Balance versus Arena Balance, same with Mythic Plus Balance versus Raid Balance, so it's certainly top of mind for us. But when it comes to sort of the larger sweeping changes, we try to sort of get those established as early as possible in a season. That way, if players are trying to push for their title, you know, you know, two or three months in, they don't feel like we just like pull the rug out under. So that's sort of our thinking there. Yeah. One thing that I noticed so when it comes to in class, like I agree that uh, changing classes halfway through, like people are going to be disappointed. But and plus is something that like the rank one title for example happens at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. So even if you change something mid season, I feel like people technically do have enough time to you know maybe play another character or focus on something else they wanted to. But I guess the problem is, um, which did happen in the past, when a strong class got nerfed, all of a sudden the score that people were able to achieve with a certain class is not achieved. Exactly, yeah. That is a huge problem. So, I mean, I see the issues, but I just, uh, <laughs> I wish classes would be balanced more than class. Oh, for I sure, for sure. I see that it's problematic when it comes to it's it's just you know a very large design challenge at the end of the day especially with you know hero talents now we're not doubling specs but we almost kind of are um and then you apply that to not just mythic plus but content like delves because a ton of players are going to be playing delves those is going to be a huge part of the game so we have to take that into account it's just a lot of variables and a lot of content that we need to support um mythic plus is certainly one of them though um i think one thing that we are trying to accomplish a little bit differently this time around, though, when we talk about War Within, is making sure that, you know, season over season, the quote unquote meta feels a little bit different, at least, because I think in the past, that's been places where we can do one. Mm -hmm. um, okay, there's another question about Delft that I did not submit first. Can I still ask you? I'll yes, but we may not have an amazing answer <laughs> for you. <laughs> All right, so since you were speaking about class balancing and Delft, uh, I was wondering, because of course, you can do Delft by yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, it's probably incredibly difficult to make sure that each and every spec can do the DELs, like, so they're balanced between one another, right? So a tank has the same, like, a hard time or easy time as a tier versus, like, a healer or a damage. And I was wondering if you're, uh, first of all, going to address that with the, the way the DELF works, depending on what class you're playing at, or if you're uh, able to change specs, um, like, to have certain in talents or abilities do more damage in Delves. You know? Can balance is different. Well, I can talk a little bit about balance and Delves. Sure, Delves and a great level of class in it. So the, the way Delves balancing is working is actually a little bit based on some of the stuff we've done in the past that is like sort of classless instance-based content. And so what that means is that if you go in with a healer, um, we're able to actually tune the experience to work a little bit differently for a healer versus a tank versus DPS. So that's one side. Um, the, the reality is doing damage is how you throw monsters. So being able to do some level of damage and your ability to do that will dictate how maybe the difficulty level that you can go through in certain kinds of attacks of the monsters and the higher end versions of Bell, that may still be true. They should still, like the intention is that they're still accomplishable with anybody, um, but it may be maybe a little bit easier for a high DPS class to get through certain things versus a healer who might take a little bit longer but can still do things, right? 
um, on the class side? I mean, on the class side, like if, you know, let's say Resto Shaman is having a hard time versus, you know, only pre several healers, we do have tools to make it easier for certain specs or in some cases, dare I say, even harder for certain specs if necessary to make sure that content is similar. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. All right. So then I wanted to talk a little bit about the tank uh, and healer adjustments um, that you talked about or that you applied to your class. As far as I understood, the idea was that tanks are supposed to take a little bit more sustained damage. Okay. So the healer is required to heal them a little bit more. Not to like sit there and spam heal the tank, but just to have to keep an eye on the tank. And if the tank does not get any healing by the healer for a long time, then they should eventually die and shouldn't be able to survive forever. Once that changes were applied, I talked to some of the tanks and I did some dungeons myself on beta. And some tanks said that it didn't have as much impact as they thought it would have by reading the flowers. And some people said, okay, did they notice it? But only with some healers, maybe not with others. So these changes that you did, um, do you think that it hit the mark and it's required? It was intended the way it was had? Or do you think that that's still something you're working on and like maybe changing some notes throughout? Uh... Sure. Yeah. Oh, do, do I'll, I'll jump in. Sure, yeah, go for it. But I, I'm, I'm a big Mythic Plus player, so I'm excited to have this change. What I thought, thought was funny about this one was that um, the community conversation around the Blue Post was a lot bigger than the impact of the change yeah. themselves, right? Everybody was up in arms. Uh, everybody that I was watching was talking about, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're doing this. It's going to be so much harder. But then when you actually play it, it's, it's not that impactful. It does change things up a little bit. It does, you know, it's, again, it's about tuning knobs. We tuned it just a little bit one way, and we'll see how it goes. And that increases maybe the value of health stones in your dungeon, or it increases survivability a little bit more. Uh, you might choose some talent for survivability that you might not have chosen in the past. But um, the reality is, uh, right now, they're feeling pretty good about it. But we'll see uh, as the season kicks off and things progress, they'll we'll definitely be paying some close attention. All right, so then I have some more questions about that change. And um, because you also mentioned that that change might reduce incoming loot like damage, because that was something that in Dragonfly was a big problem in my communities, that the survivability of the group was incredibly important. And it was like the main thing that was holding you back usually and not necessarily the damage they were doing. And that's something that I personally didn't enjoy. And I think I got a lot of feedback from other people as well that said they would rather like. Uh, make sure that adapt the damage is something that they can optimize and that's what's holding them back rather than them just dying to a boss without having any defensive life and they're just kind of doing about it. Uh, do you think that this change with the tanks is actually going to affect that aspect? So they like, the person has to heal the tank more, that you're tuning back the incoming group wide damage so that the group survivability is not going to be as important as it was in Dragon Box? That's the intent, but it obviously has a lot of nuance and it depends on the fight, it depends on the dungeon, it depends on the situation. The goal is um, not to make it more complex, but to change where the complexity is. So you're focusing a little bit more on the tank, you're focus focusing a little bit less on keep finger button, but you're still going to have to focus on keep finger button. Yeah. People are going to will have to use their defensives at appropriate times and just be you know careful that way. And that, that will still continue to be a part of it. Okay. And uh, if this change is not going to affect that group's vulnerability um, as much as you wanted it to, do you still consider nerfing the defensives of damage healers across the horde to kind of um, fix the whole situation of the incoming damage and having to be tuned so highly because the, the damage healers have so many defensives available to them? Yeah. This might be a good class, but sure. <laughs> it, it's a little bit of an arms race, right? Like we buff player defensives by things like hero talents, so ray damage used to go up, so healers have more to do. But if players don't hit those defensives in some groups, you know, not, not everyone's playing at the highest season level, heroes having a bad time. That is definitely something we talk about quite a bit. In terms of actually adjusting players' defensives for content like Mythic Plus, it's difficult because then we're adjusting defensives for players that are only doing delves or only doing world content there's a lot of people to consider and also raids um i don't think for now you go so far as to be hitting players defenses but like michael said uh this is just the very beginning there's a lot of knobs that we need to tune still and we'll, we'll be tuning going into season one of the war within so you know time will tell but as of right now we have no plans to sort of hit player defenses okay I'm going to keep asking the question. Ask last time as well. Sure. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, uh, then uh, one more question about this, uh, about implants in general. Sure. Uh, I wanted to know, because in my opinion, there's two things that can hold you back in the implants. For you, like to time it or not time it, uh, like two major things. Number one would be survivability, like you're just stuck on a golf and you can't pull it because the ability just drops it so you blend, you're running out of defensives. Yeah. Or you manage to do the whole dungeon, but you're running out of time. So you basically are, if we're not efficient enough, you didn't do enough damage. Uh, so now, a scenario where a team has like the best calm possible for this dungeon, for this situation, and has near perfect gameplay. What would you think is like the ideal scenario? Like what would be holding this group back on like the highest key level that can do? Hmm. That, <laughs> that's an interesting theoretical question for this expansion. Um, well, I think if you're pushing at the highest keys, it is because of the way we changed the, uh, the affixes, right? It, it used to be true that on tyrannical leagues, you were really good at stumped. And that was like, you just didn't, couldn't get past certain passive killers, that kind of thing. Theoretically now, every week would be the same. It'll feel the same. So you'll be pushing, it'll be more about throughput. You you will probably for certain bosses and certain abilities, which are gonna run into like, this is the thing that is always killing me at a certain level. Um, but I think more broadly speaking, it's gonna be pretty good. Okay. Later. I would go that route too. In, in the war within the world, I think my gut says it's going to be more like rating where you're going to want to continue doing content over and over until you master it. And then you're going to want to figure out like, oh, I'm going to save my two minute cooldown for this pack, my three minute cooldown for this pack. But that didn't work out. So next, well, next time I'll do that, I'm going to move that around. And optimizing like player damage and healer damage and tank damage is going to be a big part of it. That's, that's my goal. Yeah, that's really good to hear because uh, I personally always think that's more fun to like if you run out of time at the end or you like talk to move, okay, let's do this differently, so pull that differently, try to make this pull more efficient. I feel like that's more fun than to just yeah, yeah, about an ability of one. Yeah, you, totally. like, when so you many use, options yeah. to survive. So. Nobody likes getting stomped and not being able to do anything. Yeah. All right, then uh, I have another question about hero talents. So the hero talent trees, of course, that continue new in the world within. And there are some hero talent trees that are either incredibly like flashy looking and really like satisfying. And there are some hero talent trees that change your gameplay a lot in that regard. And then there's other hero talent trees that are maybe not as satisfying, maybe like passive talents don't impact your rotation as much, and others that are maybe not uh, like visually as, uh, as interesting as others. Is that something that uh, you're aware of and that you're like working on improving throughout the world within? Or did you like? Are you not planning on any major changes in the hero talents? Good question. Um, hero talents, I hear you say, they're not going anywhere. Uh, the moment that, you know, we sort of launch, they're part of your classes stack. They're evergreen. They're not going away after war within. We're going to treat them like how we treat, treat classes and specs. And if Dragonfly is anything to show for it, we've done a lot of redesigns, a lot of updates for specs and classes over that expansion. So in terms of updates for hero talents, stuff like that, certainly on the docket. In terms of um, visuals, we definitely have a goal of making sure that they feel visually distinct from each other. Some will naturally be more flashy. I think it's hard to be flashier than summoning four horsemen of the apocalypse on like a three minute cooldown. Like it's kind of hard to top that. Yes. Um, but there's also value in something that's a little bit sort of smaller and more like passive because not all players want to have, you know, very complex hero talent trees. So in terms of visuals, you know, we're always trying to do better there. Um, and, you know, players can certainly expect updates in that field. In terms of passive versus complex, we understand that for some players, talents are inherently very complex. Specs already feel potentially too complex for them. So for some hero talents, we often make them a little bit simpler, a little bit more passive, because players essentially need to pick one or the other. So some trees will be more passive, some will be more complex. The last thing we wanted to do is have players feel like they need to sort of like, oh, every single hero country, gives me a new button or change something dramatically. That's not really a goal of ours. We want them to feel more like flavor than anything else um, and have your class and spec be dictated more by your class and spec trees. Okay, yeah, makes sense. All right, so I have to ask one more question. Otherwise, uh, the Moonkin community is going to be mad. So, Moonkins. <laughs> so, um, the hero talents for Moonkins um, have been a little bit underwhelming for most of the community, at least if you like that, but I'm my personal opinion as well. And um, the gameplay for Moonkin is seems 
lackluster because we lost a kind of full star and we didn't really get any compensation for it. At least I feel like we didn't get as much of a gameplay compensation as Pacer was. And in addition, it feels like the damage is also a little bit lackluster too. Is that something that you're aware of and that maybe is getting addressed? Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, a lot of community feedback is on our radar. We read a lot. We read Reddit, we read forums. Um, honestly, if someone makes a TikTok about class tuning, I'm probably going to watch it at some point. It's going to show up in my for you, uh, for you page. So yeah, we're aware of people's sort of complaints and feedback, whether that's positive or negative. Um, I'm going to start from the middle of that question. In terms of sort of numerical updates to hero talents or being good in general, um, we're still planning to do, you know, like I mentioned previously, there will be tuning passes going into season one, the war within, and there'll be tuning passes into the war within for season one. So all that stuff is on the table, not just for Minkin, but for essentially any hero talent or class of spec. Uh, we want to make sure that season one is as good as possible. Um, in terms of hero talent updates or redesigns, can't really talk too much about that at this point. Um, we're, you know, we're happy with how they're going for launch. That being said, we are, you know, discussing future updates from Minkin down the line, not for launch, but for a future patch. And we're looking to sort of address a lot of the pain points that Minkin brought up for sure. All right, that was really good to hear. I love that answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> then I have uh, two more bonus questions. Oh boy. <laughs> so you mentioned that you really do like spiders the last time I knew you were having an interview. And I was wondering if you had a really interesting cool fact about spiders that you could share with us. Uh, oh, that's a, that's a fascinating. That's all of you. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, well, I, I guess, man, with which to choose. I think actually the one that I asked Sharon that I like the most is oh, so I have spider yes, tattoos. This one on the top was actually a spider that I had in the office. Oh. Uh, was a tarantula that um, folks in the office knew about. Um, some people were uncomfortable with it, so I brought it home. And unfortunately, she passed away during the pandemic. This one is one I found camping with my son, and it has. Uh, it's hard to see, but it has all its babies at the bottom. And then this bottom one was another one that when people at the office learned that I like spiders. They brought more spiders to me, which is why I now have more spiders at my desk that are um, sort of on display. And that was the biggest one of these. So, that is very, very cool. So hopefully that's a cool fact, but I, that I like it. That is very cool. <laughs> All right. Do you also share that excitement for spiders? Or I think spot Like crab song. <laughs> uh, uh, Arachnophobia mode is great. I, I don't personally mind spiders. I think they're neat. Uh, you know, maybe not so much as micro, but yes, they're great. I'm mean, looking forward to killing a bunch of spiders in the ray, that's for sure. Um, but no, spiders are neat. All right. I also saw that you really like kimchi. <laughs> I love kimchi. <laughs> I've never had kimchi before. You have to try it. <laughs> you have to try it. There's so many variations. Like there's cabbage. I live. So what's like the best way? Like what's, can you recommend any kind of kimchi? Yeah, like an eight, different... like... Well, I think you have to start with like the radish kimchi. Like radish kimchi is sort of the classical kimchi. Um, there's also like cubed radish, which is my personal favorite. Um, there's Napa cabbage, which is probably the more traditional kimchi. Uh, is it spicy? It, I'm not a big fan of spice. I wouldn't say it's very spicy, but definitely has a kick. Okay. There, there, so there's there's a lot of types of kimchi. I'm talking about kimchi. Um, there's there's red kimchi, which is traditional kimchi, and that is spicier. There's also white kimchi, which is less spicy. So maybe you should try that. White kimchi. White kimchi. Uh, I grew up in Bulgaria. Uh, I grew up eating a lot of like pickled foods. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of like equivalent foods to that here. There's like pickled vegetables, and that's not really the same thing. Um, and I just really like to taste the kimchi. It reminds me of home. Okay, really cool. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna try You should. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> All right, thank you so, so much for Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, that was of course. <laughs> Pleasure meeting you. All right. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so cool. much. Thank you. <laughs>